right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. Good to see some new faces this week. Um, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen and amen. Let me get this all set up here. Well, we're going to finish out the book of Ecclesiastes today. Um, believe it or not, we began this in January, um, and we've now come to the end of the book. I pray that you've been blessed uh, through it. And as we come to the close of the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher will now bring in to even sharper focus for us that life is but a mist, it's a vapor, it's for a short while. He brings into sharp focus for us the vanity of youth um, by using metaphorical language that represents the reality of living in a body that is subject to futility. The book of Romans tells us that all creation is subject to futility, to decay, that it's where we are breaking down. Uh, the reality is the first day of life, the day of conception, actually begins the first day of your death. That's just the reality of our bodies. Um, <clears throat> we kind of, I guess we're like, we're like COVID. We kind of go, we peak, and then we're just going to go down on the other side. Um, <clears throat> The preacher brings us into um, stark reality for us. If you remember from last week in chapter 11, verse 8, he said this, And so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. And it's this days of darkness that uh, the preacher now picks up again in chapter 12. At the last uh, two verses of chapter 12, he gives the end of the matter. And that's actually the title of today's sermon, The End of the Matter. So would you stand with me as I will read from God's Word. We'll read Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll pray and we'll see what God says to us today. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day in which the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the window are dimmed, and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, and dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he spoke words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter has been heard. Fear God and keep his commands. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Well, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord God, again, that you would teach us, instruct us, and guide us. Give us wisdom through your Holy Spirit to hear, to understand, and most importantly, to apply what you teach us this day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The preacher begins with, remember also your creator. Remember also your creator. He says, remember also the creator in the days of your youth. And in reading this verse, we see very clearly who the preacher is actually writing to. 
He is writing to young people who have not gone very far down the path of life. And perhaps they're searching for meaning in life. Um, Ecclesiastes is a book that is revered by theologians. It's revered by uh, secular people. Um, and just in studying, you see quotes from famous people about the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, it, it's a book that is known for people looking for purpose, for, for what is the meaning of life. And, and, and uh, oftentimes it may seem that Ecclesiastes is just a depressing book, but it's not actually a depressing book. It's in a book that, 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 tell, that gives the appeal uh, of, to live a life of wisdom under the sun. More importantly, it tells us to live in the fear of God under heaven while we live under the sun. And so the preacher says, remember also the creator in the days of your youth. And we must remember the context in which Ecclesiastes was written. The preacher said that he was king over Jerusalem. For the Jewish people, the center of Jewish life was where? The temple. Everything surrounded around the temple, the tabernacle. Actually, for him, it would be the tabernacle. Everything revolved around the word of God, the commandments given by God. Every Jewish person, every Jewish young boy was taught to remember their creator. Walter Kaiser says this, because really the preacher is telling us, is giving us a call to action and what we know and what we are taught. Walter Kaiser, in his commentary, says this. To remember our Creator calls for decisive action based on the mental recollection and reflection on all that God is doing and has done for us. This action must go way beyond the cognitive act of calling something to mind. It must result in an action appropriate to that recollection. I love that. The action must go way beyond the cognitive act of calling something to mind, right? We can remember God's goodness, but if it doesn't produce something in us, then it's just like remembering um, something from high school. It has no, no value, no bearing. Um, I could remember that uh, uh, Grendel was the main character in Beowulf. Who cares? When you think about who God is, when you think about him, there be just something real should happen with inside us. This is the living God of the universe. This is the God who spoke. Boom. This is the God who said, I am placing my love upon you. You know you don't deserve it. It shouldn't just be, oh, yeah, God's good and, you know, when we pray and we thank God, it should have meaning, it should be passionate behind it. The action must go way beyond the cognitive act of calling something to mind. It must result in an action appropriate to that recollection. And for some of us, that's great joy. Some of us, it brings us to tears. See, the assumption is that the young have heard of their creator, and it is now incumbent upon the person who's heard about their creator for them to take action. And the preacher says to do this. Do it before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Well, already we see he's painting a picture that doesn't seem to be too happy, right? There's days that are coming that are evil and which will say we have no pleasure. And see here the preacher brings us into uh, 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 un no uncertain terms the reality of growing old. He does it by metaphorically describing for us the days of darkness spoken in Ecclesiastes 11.8. Let me read it for you again. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Chapter 11, he calls them days of darkness. And here in chapter 12, verse, uh, he calls them days of evil or evil days. And evil here does not mean sinful, but rather it means trouble or misfortune. 
There are days, these days are days in which a person will say, I have no pleasure in that. So what the preacher is telling us is that the golden years really won't be so golden. Don't, don't you just feel uplifted already? Isn't this exciting to hear? Listen how the preacher describes the last years of life. Verse 2, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. Secular scholars and biblical scholars agree that Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is, is one of the greatest poems ever written. I mean, listen to it. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. He reminds us that there is a season in life in which we are most productive. And that season is youth. Our physical bodies begin to work less efficiently as we age, and that's just the fact. I don't know about you, but um, you know, we have three dogs now, three other children. And um, when I get down on the floor and I'm playing with the dogs, I sure hope the sofa's nearby because I need it to help me get up. I feel it in my knees and in my back. Some of you know, go out and work in the yard, go in your garden, and, and you, you know that going into it, you're going to come out and you're going to pay for it, right? You know it's going to cost you. Some of us have even had body parts replaced. We have a new knee, we have a new hip. Thank God parts can be replaced today, right? Imagine living in the preacher's time. You had a bad knee. You just had a bad knee. You just had to live with it. The analogy that the preacher uses is of a house that has slowly gone into disrepair. In New York, where I hunt down the road from our old house, um, a good friend of mine lets me hunt on his property. And on that property is the old farmhouse. And I've watched it over the years just go into decay. Just slowly, the earth just takes it back in. That's the analogy that the preacher uses. Listen to how he says it. He says, in the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. And the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. Well, this is how the imagery would play out. The keepers of the house that tremble are the arms that start to shake with old age. Many of you know that my dad lives with us now, and he has Parkinson's, and he shakes. It's hard to eat. It's hard to do anything. The strong men that are bent are the legs and the, you know, the body that is just bent over due to old age. And the grinders are pretty obvious. It's the teeth. He says, the, he says the grinders uh, cease because they are few or you have none at all. And you go back to the same food you began life on. Life, food that is pureed. Those who look through the windows are dimmed. Obviously, that's the eyes. The eyesight begins to go. You think of Jacob on his bed when his eyesight was all gone. The doors on the street are shut. The hearing begins to go. The rising of the sound of a bird refers to the lack of sleep you have as an older person. I don't know if you experienced that, but... I see him, he sleeps less. It's not, it's not as good a sleep as it used to be. The daughters of the song are the vocal cords that just become less and less, talk lower and lower. These are not the only effects of growing old. Listen to what else the preacher says. He says in verse 5, he says, They are afraid of also... What is high and terrors are in the way, the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails. Being afraid of what is high is to be afraid to fall. 
terrorists on the way as being vulnerable to attack or being taken advantage of. And again, we have to go back to the culture and the time. Old Jerusalem was a, was a, it has narrow streets and it was a busy city. If you're an older person with the use of a cane trying to walk in the hustle and bustle of a crowd, it's terrifying for them. We always hear of people scamming the elderly. The almond trees, they have white flowers, and that refers to white hair, so I'm well on my way. The grasshopper that drags itself along. What vivid pictures the preacher uses. Anybody who's ever seen a grasshopper, he springs and he jumps, but the one who drags himself along, it's just harder to get around. One commentator uh, uh, writes, uh, the grasshopper dra drags along means he's a goner. <laughs> wow. Um, desire failing, or if you use the New American Standard version, it says uh, the caperberry is ineffective. Simply means the loss of sexual desire because a caperberry was an ancient aphrodisiac. In his poetic style, the preacher says, this is what the end of life looks like before one goes off into eternity. Well, let's just close our service there. Aren't you excited to come to church today, right? Well, that's the reality of life. Not everybody will go this way. But for the most of us, this is how it goes. We break down. We break down because eventually we're all going to die. 100% of all people die. That's a fact. You can, that's a fact you can count on. We're all going to go to our eternal home. As Ecclesiastes 12, 5 and 7 says, because man is going to his eternal, <coughs> to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets Look at how poetically he says it. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We're all going to die, and we're all going to return to dust. Just as God said to Adam in Genesis 3.19. Again, as we said, if we stop here in the text, it doesn't seem very uplifting. But actually, uh, it, it seems quite depressing to think how this is going to go. I think about my own knees. I say, wow, man. I think about trying to keep up with my, my sons. If they, uh, uh, we go camping or whatever. You know, it's hard. I could never win a race against them anymore. It used to be a day when I, I was the man. I was the champion. Not anymore. He said, hey, you want to wrestle? I don't want to wrestle anymore because I'll just lose. So why do it? So it seems very depressing. But if we've actually been listening to Ecclesiastes, it's really not depressing, but he's actually hopeful in what he's saying. In, in, in bringing us into stark reality of how life, he says that's a good thing because it causes us to think. Remember what he said about being at a funeral home. It's good to go to the house of mourning because there we get an understanding of the vanity of life. It should cause us to think correctly. See, Ecclesiastes 12 is an exhortation to the young to think wisely about time, to realize they don't have as much time as they think they do. We've all been there, haven't we, in our youth? Oh, I got all the time in the world. Oh, I, and, and, and we do a lot of stupid things because we think we're invincible. It's by God's grace I've only ever broken one bone in my life. It's by God's grace I didn't burn the house down or kill somebody or my friends. The stuff we did is just amazing. Um, all because we were young and thought we were invincible. We had all the time in the world. And it really is true. You learn about life when you start paying for your own rent and your own food. Boy, that should hopefully grow you up real quick. So it's an exhortation to the young to think wisely, to live in the fear of God. But it's also an exhortation to the older people, to the elderly, that they still have time. 
They have not become useless because of their old age. Despite what we do in America to our elderly, which is just disgusting. I mean, think about the author of the book. We don't know if it's Solomon or not, but whether he is or is, it doesn't really matter. But we know that the author wrote this book when? At the end of his life. He, as an old man, wrote this book. He has not outlived his usefulness. In this book, he tells us about the, in, in chapter, um, chapter 9, about the one old wise man who saved an entire city. This just proves that you never outlive your usefulness. And the scriptures, by the way, elevate the elderly. Look what it says in Titus chapter 2, verses 2 and 5. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. The work of the kingdom is done when you die. And maybe for some of us, and we know people who, you know what, they're just not able to, they just... They're just in a bed for the last years of their life. Doesn't mean they're ineffective. Because the effects of how we live will last for years. Remember earlier in the book, he says a good name is desired more than precious gems. I think about Robbie Zacharias who passed away just a few weeks ago. Do you think his ministry is over? Oh, absolutely not. See, this is a call for everyone, young and old, or older, to be involved in the church and to be involved in each other's lives. You older ones, listening or here, get to know the young ones in our church, the young couples, the young singles. You have life experiences and have gone down the road that you could help them in ways you didn't know. You just got to build a relationship with them. All this comes with us saying, you know what? I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to invest in others. As Romans 13 says, we're going to outdo one another in honor. It's actually a very encouraging. Hey, this is how life is going to be. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? It's not going to change. This is what God has given. It's a gift to us, even though the wording you'd say, that's not a gift. But it's a motivator to live wisely. It shows us the urgency, as we talked about last week, of time. And as the preacher will soon bring us to, again, of judgment. We're told again about wisdom and why the preacher writes. See, all along we've been told why the preacher was writing, but now we're being told how he wrote. All along he's told he, he searched out wisdom and folly so that he could know life. He could understand living life under the sun, and, he, and it brought him to that um, to just live under the sun is pointless. They need to live in the fear of God under heaven. And now in verses 9, 9 to 12, we have another speaker. We have now the third person. If you remember way back from the beginning, that many say that the chapter 1 and the end of chapter 12 are like uh, two different authors. They're like bookends talking about the, the guy who spoke in the middle, the preacher. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But this is what it says about wisdom is firmly fixed. 
It says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he spoke words of truth. He taught knowledge through the writing of Proverbs. It's probably another indication that it could be Solomon as the, as the author, but again, it doesn't matter if it's Solomon or not. He taught knowledge through the writing of Proverbs, but it says he also sought words of delight. Words of delight such as it's good to be in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. You know what? It's good to hear that your teeth are going to fall out of your mouth. It's good to hear that. It may not seem like words of delight. It can seem rather depressing. But the truth is Ecclesiastes is a very uplifting and encouraging book. It says that out of true concern, words that are true, the preacher wrote words of truth. So this is not only true of Ecclesiastes, but it's also true of the whole Bible. The writer of Scripture is the only wise God who is full of grace and truth. He gave us words that are true and that are for our benefit, though at times they may seem to hurt us. Think about Peter when he preached the first sermon in Acts chapter 2. It says they were cut to the heart. Of course, that brought about a response. They said, what should we do? When we hear about the shortness of life, we should ask ourselves, what should we do? When we hear that we're going to be brought into judgment, we should ask ourselves, what should we do? Notice what he says. They're written by one shepherd. Verse 11. These words of the wise are like goads and like nails. Firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. The words of the wise are like goads. A goad is, is basically a stick with a sharp point. And the shepherd, as he would herd the cattle or the sheep or whatever long he would take, and he would poke them in the back end just to get them moving. The modern equivalent would be the cattle prod. You've heard the word goads. He's referring them to the words of the wise, who were the words of Scripture. You've heard the word goads before. Remember the apostle Paul, as he was going to Damascus, and God knocked him off the horse. And he said to Paul, Paul, it's hard to kick against the goads. You're not going to stand against my word or me. He says they're like nails that are firmly fixed. The word of God is steadfast and will what? The word of the Lord, what? Endureth for a short time, endureth forever. Every other thing in this world is subject to futility. It's going to fall to the side. It's going to disappear. The only thing left will be the word of God. It says they are given by one shepherd. What an incredible statement this is. This is an incredible statement on the inspiration of Scripture. The Bible is a book made of 66 books, 39 in the old and 27 in the new, 35 different authors who were what? Driven along by the Holy Spirit. One author, God, one shepherd. And yet these many human authors maintain their individuality. As 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us, all scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God, the man or woman of God, may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible alone is authoritative for these things. And that's why we need to listen to the advice of Ecclesiastes 12.12. 12. My son, beware of anything beyond these what? God, remembering God, 
So son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Boy, that's true. How many of us went through school? So don't, <laughs> pointless to read these books. Studying is a weariness of the flesh. That's true. But is he saying that reading books is bad? No. It's not bad to read books. I recommend books to you all the time. I read books. It's good to read books. It's good to have study aids. I use them all the time to, 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 to put together a sermon. What he's telling us is we need to remember that there is only one book. Ultimately, there is only one book that has life and power in and of itself. It's the Bible. There's absolutely no other book like the Bible. Throughout history, what one book has been the subject of persecution? It's the Bible. So if you take verse 11 and verse 12 together, they can be summed up in two words. Scripture alone. And then finally, the preacher says, here is the end of the matter. The last two verses of this book sum up the entire book of Ecclesiastes. He says, the end of the matter has been heard. In other words, I've finished searching out wisdom and folly under the sun. Here it is. It's all been heard. Here's what I've come up with. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. To fear God and keep his commandments is to remember our creator, as the preacher said in verse 1. Or as God says to the children of Israel and says to us in Deuteronomy 10, 12, And now, Israel, church, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. How do we remember God? What is the key to remembering God? Well, I'll tell you, I believe repetition is the key to not forgetting God. How did you learn the timetables? Repetition. Repetition. Over and over and over. Repetition is the key to not forgetting God. Repetition allows us to walk in His ways and to love and to serve Him with all our heart because repetition keeps it at the forefront of our minds and our hearts. What the preacher is telling us is the truth of the glory of God alone. As Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. When it says the whole duty of man, it's better translated this, the whole of man. It really means that this is really all there is to life. We were created to fear God and to keep his commandments. Everybody is going to be judged under that. Charles Bridges in his commentary says this, Quitting therefore the world with all its vanities, we betake ourselves of that, which alone is free from vanity, the fear and service of God. These two points, these two points the preacher <clears throat> pronounces to contain the whole of man, not his duty only, but his whole happiness and busyness, business, the total sum of all that concerns him, all that God requires of him, all that the Savior enjoins, all that the Holy Spirit teaches and works in him. See, to fear God and keep His commandments is Trinitarian in nature. Reminds me of what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says in question number one. What is the chief end of man? And the answer they give is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that's really the part of it, enjoying God. I can have all the facts about God. I can have all the memory things about God. And I can repeat things about God. But if I'm not enjoying God, then I've missed it completely. Then the books just become academic to me. You might as well just go study Shakespeare. 
it, it'll have the same value in your life. The preacher reminds us that God will bring everything under judgment. Verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The preacher has reminded us that not only is time a reason to live wisely and to live in the fear of God, but also because God will bring every deed into judgment, right? What is left out of every deed? Nothing. Jesus has told us that every word we speak will give an account for. Man, I don't want to die. <laughs> but I also wish you could go mute, right? But it's also every word that we've spoken in our heart. Every secret thing, whether good or evil. All of us will stand before the judgment seat of God. Not a single person gets a pass. And all that we've done will be judged, whether good or evil. As Paul tells us in Corinthians, that it's either going to burn up as wood, hay, and stubble, or it's going to pass as gold, silver, and precious gems. This is an important truth that we need to know. That we should be afraid of God. And this is, an, this is the key component of evangelism. You are under the judgment of God and there's one way to get out of it. And only one way. Again, how do we fear God and keep His commandments? It's to remember Him. As Charles Bridges says, because I just found his commentary the most helpful on, uh, on chapter 12. It says, the remembrance of our Creator is in connection with every godly exercise. Does a day ever pass in the willful neglect of the Bible without serious loss? How well does your day go when you just skip devotions and don't think it's important? Do we not suffer seriously in our own souls by giving too little time, too little heart, too secret prayer? Really? Do we ever suffer harm by praying too much? No. But we suffer by not praying. Wherever God can be found, let us be in the act and energy of seeking Him. And where can be God, God be found, does the Scripture tell us? David writes, Behold, if I, make, if, I, if I fly to heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in the depths, what? There you are. Where is God? Everywhere. God is everywhere at the same time and to the same degree. That's his omnipresence. Acknowledge, as one says, his word by consulting it. Hmm. His providence by observing it. His wisdom by admiring it. His sovereignty by acquiescing in it. Let's let that sink in for a little bit. His sovereignty by acquiescing in it. Stop fighting against what God has decreed. God has decreed COVID. God has decreed that we wear a mask and sit six feet apart. Why fight it? His faithfulness by relying on it. How often do we forget his faithfulness when trouble comes? When we're anxious, we need to go back. We need to, again, as Pat will sing to us, he'll do it again. His kindness by being thankful for it. Think about that for a moment. When the futility of life comes in, when a loved one dies, when tragedy strikes, because man does not know his time or what evil may befall him, as the preachers told us. Yes, we're sorrowful. And yes, we ask God for comfort. But you know what will help us in life and at times when, when life is hard is to remember the kindness of God. To remember that, you know what, God? When all is said and done, you've promised this. That if you've placed your love upon me, I am not going to go to hell. When you put that into perspective, 
Then we can understand the light and momentary afflictions, afflictions, as Paul says, which are not worth comparing to the weight of glory. The end of the matter has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. And I pray, Lord, you help me as the shepherd. Help us, Lord, that we would fear you and keep your commandments. Because in them there's life. There's health. There's health spiritually. There's life. There's help. And it keeps us from the judgment of yourself. So Lord, I pray that you would help us, especially in a day and an age in which we live, in which we look at our televisions and we see complete anarchy, a complete uh, uh, going about of man's own desires, where we see even more and more clearly man is shaking his fist at you and saying, I will break off your bonds, that I will be like God. So Lord, I pray that you help us, your children, to fear God and keep your commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so that at the end of life, whether we live through the shaking limbs and the loss of teeth or anything else, Lord God, but at the end, we would hear from you these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of my kingdom in which there is nothing that is vain. And we ask it in Jesus' name.